using swords, really not as simple as it may look in movies and video games. There's a lot of complexity here, so I'm just gonna give you an idea of what's involved. So let's look at different ways to cut. And I limited to just cutting because if we're talking about ways to use a sword, so including thrusts, half sorting, etc., etc., this will take way too long. So here's a good example of a type of sword that really dictates its use. And that just so happens to be a rather intuitive use. This is a Ewart Park type bronze sword made by Neil Burridge in the UK. So this really only gives you one option. It has this large pommel here that forces your hand and your wrist in a certain position. Hammer grip and with the wrist almost at 90 degrees. You can move it forward a little bit, but not too much because then it starts to dig into the wrist and there's really no way to use a handshake grip here or any other way of holding it that is not completely impractical and weak. Here you can see if I hold it forward, this is, this is my reach. If you wanted to extend your reach, you would have to overextend your wrist, which puts a lot of strain on the wrist, can lead to injury, and it's just a weak position. So this tells us that this is how it needs to be used. You can use just a wrist. This is the quickest kind of cut. You can cut from the elbow instead, which is more powerful, but not quite as fast. And then finally, you can cut from the shoulder with these sweeping slashes that are very powerful, but of course, take a bit longer and telegraph more. There's one other way in which it could be gripped, and that is with a thumb grip. We can't know for sure if they did it in the Bronze Age. And here you can run the risk of overanalyzing a sword design. You could look at this shape here and say, oh see, this is where the thumb is supposed to go. A lot of bronze swords have this, but not all, and it's not shaped the same way every time. So, I mean, it's possible. It's possible that this was the idea, but we, we really can't say for sure. And so this is another way to use it. This is an even more retracted position. If an opponent was basically in the swordsman's face, this could still be used to deliver extremely retracted cuts. And it could also potentially be used to try to strike over top of the shield, like this. Strike the head over top. So the difference here is, instead of doing a rising cut like this, with the thumb grip, you do it like this. So this versus this. Let's look at a later design. This is a langes messer or long knife as it translates. These were used between the 14th and 16th century. Here you have a different handle shape that accommodates different kinds of techniques. So you can use a hammer grip with this if you want to perfectly possible, but this is also what you see in the manuscripts. It's a more forward oriented grip, handshake grip like this. So you can see the difference in reach. This is my reach with a hammer grip. With a handshake grip, it extends quite noticeably. And it's not just how you wrap your fingers around the grip, it's also how you engage them. So you can tense the bottom fingers to give it a snappier movement and get the cut started, basically. You can also do that with a hammer grip. With a hammer grip, you grip it more tightly with the top two fingers and keep the bottom fingers loose, and then you squeeze the bottom fingers. This kind of initiates the cut. If I tighten the bottom fingers, you can see the rotation starts. So it starts here and then this is, you can give it a little bit of extra velocity, basically. And again, you can cut from the wrist, the elbow, or the shoulder, depending on how much power you want to put into it or uh, whether you need it to be quicker. And the next uh, evolution, if you will, in sort design is this right here with additional bars, rings, 
on the guard that keep the finger safe. So the idea is you put the index finger over the guard. So you have a more forward oriented blade position. This way you can use a lot more reach. It also facilitates more control over the point in the thrust. And uh, with this, again, you can easily use wrist cuts. This is not a powerful kind of cut. It's quick, but doesn't do as much damage, obviously. Okay, so what about using a sword with both hands, be it a large Kriegsmesser war knife like this, or a long sword or a hand and half sword, uh, katana, etc. Any kind of sword you can use with two hands. Now this adds a different dimension to it because now you also have to think about the interaction of the two hands. So one of the main points of contention is whether you should just power a cut with the off hand, whether it be the left or right, depending on your handedness, or whether you should use a push-pull motion. So the way I was taught is to power it with the off hand. So basically the main hand, the more dexterous main hand is just there to control the edge alignment, make sure that you know, it's not off, you're not connecting partially with the flat, etc. So this is good for precision. If you want one of those super clean cuts on a tatami mat, that make the piece of tatami just fall straight down or even stay in place for a moment. You would really line it up very nicely, 45 degree angle, and you would pull with the left hand, stabilize with the right, in, in my case, boom. You can hear by the sound that the blade makes when the edge alignment is good. So that is a clean and powerful cut. However, there are issues with it, there are drawbacks particularly if you do this from wrath guard, for example, from a retracted position, and then you cut like this. I'll let you see if you can spot the problem with it. The issue is that the hands are somewhat exposed. Depending on how you do it, it could be pretty bad. If you do it like this, they are very exposed because now you're leading with the hands. Hands come first, they're in front of the blade. That's really not what you want because all the opponent needs to do is, is take a step back to evade it and then cut to the arms. A better way to do it is to make sure that the point moves first. So, boom. This is again where the fingers can help. Engaging the bottom fingers to start it. So, boom, and then throwing it out, can still be a little bit exposed. Now at this point, personally, I prefer the push-pull motion, and I'll tell you why. So in this case, what you do is you push forward with your main hand, and you pull back with the off hand, like this. Again, that can be combined with the finger action. Boom, like this. So. You can argue that this can introduce some inconsistencies because now both hands move independently as opposed to being like one solid unit. If just one hand pulls and the other stays exactly the same, they are not going in different directions. They're, this is going to produce the best possible edge alignment. So mechanically for cutting and for, for cutting competitions, yeah, this is the, the better way to do it in my opinion. However, with enough practice, of course, you can still deliver a perfectly good cut with a push-pull. And here is where it, it really becomes much more beneficial. If I cut from Rathgard and I actually pull the grip in first and then cast the blade out, basically, what that does is it makes sure that my hands are behind the blade the entire time. So hands come in. Come in, blade comes forward. And this is the same way you can also do a sword cut more safely. As opposed to just throwing the hands out like this, you bring the hands in and then the blade comes out. Boom. So if you compare this to this, you should see that the hands are a lot less exposed 
in one version. And finally, there is a way of emphasizing offense over defense, basically. If I follow all the way through, this is going to be very powerful. This is going to do the maximum possible damage. The problem with that is, if I end up all the way down here, it takes me longer to raise my, my blade back up to either defend myself or thrust with a point, etc. Uh, what I could do instead is to just cut, say, to here. So this way, the blade is still in front of me and I can, I can now thrust, I can defend more easily, things like that. Of course, this is going to do a lot more damage and is more likely to end the fight, but this is still going to be dangerous for the opponent and much safer for me. There is always going to be a number of different interpretations because unfortunately we cannot ask the historical masters to clarify what they meant exactly. We have to interpret what they wrote and the pictures they showed, etc. plus, uh, I'm pretty sure that based back in history there was also disagreement. Not everybody agreed on exact. In fact, there are manuscripts where individual uh, fencing masters respond to others in particular and criticize them for their way of doing it, etc. So, of course, there are different viable ways of doing it. There are also going to be obviously bad, incorrect ways. Mechanically wrong, but there are arguments to be made of mechanically superior cuts versus tactically superior cuts. For example, like I discussed earlier. Overall, how you're gonna use a sword and cut with it depends on a number of factors. The type of sword, whichever opponent the, the swordsman was facing, what the opponent was equipped with, weapon, armor, etc. Uh, it depends on the goal at the time. Do you want to cut to do as much damage as possible? Do you want to cut to obtain a bind? Do you want to cut to create another opening that you then are going to attack, etc. What is what is the intention here? So depending on that, one technique may be better than another. That's why there is a large number of techniques in the historical manuscripts, just so you have a large toolbox to work with, depending on what you need to accomplish at the time. So yeah, I hope that serves to, to give you an, an idea of the complexity involved in sword fighting. It's not as simple as just pick it up and hit things with it. And maybe that can give you some ideas for creative writing, artwork, game design, etc. Either way, hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching and have a good one, folks.